Are you the brains, the brawn, or the master thief who steals from other thieves? That's right, it's time to join forces with the Cooper Gang and go back to the days when you first played the hit series Sly Cooper, which, you know, is pretty fitting considering the gang became time travelers in the last title. Hey there, I'm Jacob with the leaderboard, and we've put on our masks to swipe all of the loot for you, even when faced against the fiendish five. So get ready to steal some knowledge, because this is 107 facts about Sly Cooper. Let's get started. Fact number one. Sly Cooper is a series of video games that combine the platforming genre with stealth elements. The first game in the series, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, was first released in 2002 as an exclusive title for the best-selling console of all time, the PlayStation 2. Number two. The original Sly Cooper trilogy was developed by Sony's very own Sucker Punch Productions. After their run with Sly was completed, they went on to create another killer app for Sony, none other than Infamous. Number three. It was decided that Sly would be a raccoon because much much like thieves, raccoons are creatures of the night. Though Sly's ambitions are a bit higher than knocking leftovers from a trash can. Number four. Sly's original design was made to be a bit closer to what an actual raccoon looks like, depicting him as short, chubby, and a bit less lively. The design moved more towards his final tall and slim appearance to better fit Sly's sneaking mechanics and acrobatic abilities. Number five. Before he was given his iconic name, Sly was originally going to be named JT. What does JT stand for? We have no idea, and neither will you. But it probably isn't just in Timberlake, as often associated. Number six. Sly's last name, Cooper, originates from the occupational English surname for one that creates or sells barrels. This could possibly be a reference to Sly's ability to hide in barrels in the first two games of the series. Number seven. Sly Cooper comes from a long line of some of history's greatest raccoon thieves that possess a family heirloom called the Thievius Raccoonus, a book detailing all of Sly's family's thieving tricks. When Sly was very young, his parents were murdered and the book was stolen by the Fiendish Five. Ten years later, Sly takes it upon himself to steal the book back and avenge the death of his parents. Number eight. Sly wasn't the first thieving raccoon Sucker Punch created. That honor goes to Jojo the Raccoon, the primary antagonist of their first game, Rocket, Robot on Wheels. Only his thieving is wrong and evil because he's not the playable protagonist, so he must be brought to justice. Number nine. Sly was born in 1984, making him 18 during the events of the first game, which takes place in 2002. As of 2017, Sly is now 33 years old, hopefully not old enough for him to hang up his cane for good. Number 10. Sly met his literal partners in crime, Bentley and Murray, at the orphanage he was sent to after Clockwork murdered his parents. They've been pulling heists together since they were tots, one of the earliest jobs being stealing the greatest treasure known to children, the cookie jar. Number 11. While Sly and Murray are orphaned with no other family in their lives whatsoever, Bentley was at least orphaned with quite a few siblings who we have yet to see in the games. Number 12. They don't call him the brains because he wears glasses. Bentley has an IQ of 140, which is considered to be the beginning of the genius portion of the IQ spectrum. Number 13. Being the stereotypical nerd that he is, Bentley has allergies. So far, he's admitted to being allergic to both tomatoes and lemons. To top it all off, he's also got asthma, thus completing the nerd trifecta. Number 14. Murray wishes he could be like Sly in the worst possible way, often attempting to absorb and mimic his tricks and movements. Unfortunately for Murray, a hippo's physique allows for a much less subtle approach to things. Number 15. The reason Murray doesn't wear pants is because nobody has designed a pair that will fit his husky hippo figure, a fact that deeply embarrasses and infuriates him. It is just not fair! Number 16. Despite being animals known to traverse water, Sly, Bentley, and Murray do not know how to swim. This is because the trio never took swimming lessons at the orphanage. And yes, raccoons can typically swim. These raccoon facts brought to you by the leaderboard. Number 17. At the time of development, character designer Dev Madan had a crush on Selma Hayek and based the design of Sly's love interest and rival Carmelita off the famous actress. This means that, whether she likes it or not, Miss Hayek has a fursona. Number 18. Before they gave her the Selma Hayek slash Jessica Rabbit treatment, Carmelita had much more of a cartoony and G-rated appearance. Her gun was also designed to look something more akin to a ridiculously proportioned acme weapon. Number 19. The developers wanted the game to look like a cartoon, but be one step closer to realism. It was decided that the 3D cel-shaded style used in games like The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker would be utilized to evoke this cartoon motif while being able to freely sneak around in an open 3D environment. Number 20. Before development began on Sly Cooper, the team gathered a series
series of photos and paintings of real-life locations that resembled the world they wanted to create. The conceptual artists also made a lot of drawings that focused on how the lighting engine would affect the art style. Number 21. The designers wanted their levels to feel like places that existed in the real world so that they wouldn't feel like repetitive and generically designed video game environments. They wanted each level to provide a unique experience and to have a distinct personality. Number 22. One of the more difficult challenges in developing the first Sly Cooper was getting the lighting to work. The developers wanted the environments to feel like they took place during a natural state of night, but not so dark that the player couldn't see, and not so light that it seemed like nighttime in a well-lit city street. They also had a multi-TV setup in the office to ensure that some of the game's washed-out color scheme would be visible on all kinds of TVs. The designers revised the lighting and colors over 30 times on the first level alone. Number 23. Sly's cane was originally intended to transform into different gadgets. One of these gadgets was a spray that would reveal invisible lasers, and some were more ridiculous contraptions similar to those out of a Batman comic, like a freeze ray that could turn enemies into blocks that the player could use as platforms. Not too far off from carrying some shark repellent spray, eh Sly? Number 24. While Sly collects coins in the final game, he was originally supposed to collect bags of cash from which green bills would erupt. The more generic coins were put in place when the developers encountered problems with localization in other countries, more specifically coloring the bills based on region. Number 25. At first, the original Sly had a warp power-up that would allow the player to more easily traverse the levels, but because the levels were pretty easy to get around in the first place, this feature was cut from the final build. Number 26. To prevent issues that may have occurred with the game's frame rate, they had one engineer on the team solely dedicated to maintaining the engine's performance throughout the entire production cycle. Number 27. Every game in the series thus far has been composed by Peter McConnell, who has been crafting catchy tunes for video games since 1991. If you've played games like Grim Fandango, Hearthstone, Heroes of Warcraft, or Psychonauts, you've heard his work. Number 28. The game contains a dynamic music system, which in layman's terms means that the music will gradually change depending on Sly's current status in the game. If he's incognito and sneaking about, the music will be light and subtle, but if he draws attention to himself, the music will intensify to Mission Impossible levels on a dime. Number 29. The developers based the designs of the enemies and NPCs on characters from the story Alice in Wonderland. Number 30. If you thought the second level of the original Sly was huge and unforgiving, be glad that the designers never saw their complete version become a reality. The second level is only a third of the size it was originally supposed to be. Number 31. To blow off steam during development for the first game, the developers held two versus two Mario tennis tournaments involving just about everybody in the company. I believe that's called fraternizing with the enemy. Traders. Number 32. Eagle-eyed players may notice a small inconsistency between the game itself and the animated cutscenes. In the cutscenes, Sly wears yellow gloves and black shoes while he dons blue gloves and shoes during gameplay. Number 33. When Sly communicates with the other characters through the Binoculum, you can use the left analog stick to turn Bentley's head while moving the right analog stick will move Sly's. Number 34. Murray can be seen wearing a Whoopi World hat during the ending cutscene for Sunset Snake Eyes. Whoopi World is the setting of Sucker Punch's first game, Rocket Robot on Wheels for the Nintendo 64. Number 35. After defeating the Panda King, a newspaper will appear. Upon closer inspection, one can see that a quote on the top left corner reads, Dude, that's kick-ass, meaning the ESRB was clearly asleep at the wheel. Number 36. While the full title of the game is Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus in the United States, the PAL versions of the original game go by the much simpler title, Sly Raccoon. Number 37. All three of the instruction manuals for the original Sly trilogy are made to resemble the Thievius Raccoonus, with each entry in the game aging and wearing down the book further and further. Number 38. Sly Cooper's suave vocals were provided by actor Kevin Miller, who has plenty of video games on his resume, including roles in Jet Set Radio, Virtua Cop 3, and House of the Dead 3. He's also the host of his own podcast, The Second Funniest Podcast, because as we all remember from our childhoods, first is the worst. Number 39. In the early stages of recording Sly's lines, the developers experimented with giving Sly somewhat of a New York accent, but it was deemed too corny, even for an anthropomorphic raccoon. Number 40. Murray is the only voice role of actor Chris Murphy, who has played the lovable hippo in all six of the character's video game appearances, which includes PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale and PlayStation Move Heroes. Number 41. When voice actor Chris Murphy first auditioned for the role of Murray, he was told by Sucker Punch that the character was going to be bisexual. He auditioned with a voice that was much more flamboyant and got the part. After getting about halfway through recording his line, Sucker Punch decided to scrap the voice as well as Murray's sexuality after it was misinterpreted by playtesters as a bad 
impression of Barney the Dinosaur. Number 42. Carmelita Fox's voice changes with every game in the series because she's never had the same voice actor for more than two mainline Sly Cooper games, causing the character to gain and lose different accents. She was voiced by the same actress, Grey Delisle, in Sly Cooper Thieves in Time and PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Number 43. Actor David Scully plays five characters across every game in the Sly Cooper series, portraying Raleigh in the first game, Dimitri and Rajan in Sly 2, Dimitri, Octavio, and Lefui in Sky 3, and Dimitri a third time in Thieves in Time. You may have previously heard Scully's voice in the original Halo trilogy, in which he played Sergeant Avery J. Johnson and the Covenant Elites. Number 44. The first game of the series contains over 700 lines of dialogue. The developers used just about everything they recorded, with very little being buried or forgotten within the disc's data. Number 45. While Sly Cooper's debut was well received critically, the game was a little lacking sales-wise, being overshadowed by both Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank. The game would hit 400,000 copies sold by 2003, giving it the PlayStation Greatest Hits label, and a price drop that certainly helped sales figures in the long run. Number 46. Sly won the award for Best Original Character at the 2003 Game Developers Conference Awards, beating out other iconic characters like Ratchet from Ratchet and Clank, Sam Fisher from Splinter Cell, and Blinks the Cat from a game that nobody remembers or cares about. Number 47. The gap between the first two Sly games is bridged by two promotional comics called The Adventures of Sly Cooper. The comic lasted two issues and was published in Gamer Pro Magazine by DC Comics. Number 48. Sucker Punch developed Sly 2 around a one-sentence pitch. Sly and the gang worked together to pull off a string of big heists. The way in which they approached designing these heists was based largely on third acts of several Hollywood heist films in which bands of the most talented criminals work together to pull off impossible crimes. Number 49. Two things the crew wanted to improve upon from the original Sly to Sly 2 was creating more open and less linear environments for the player to explore, as well as creating a diverse cast of characters with different skills that would spice up gameplay. Number 50. Early designs of Dimitri gave him the realistic proportions of a lizard whilst wearing an outfit akin to that of a pimp. We're uh, still not entirely sure uh, what sort of age rating they were gunning for at this point. Number 51. English is a second language for Dimitri. He learned how to speak it through watching numerous hip-hop videos and, oh <laughs> boy, oh boy, does it show. Have you no vision? Are you hearing what I mean to you? Number 52. The Contessa works for the Interpol police force and works to reform criminals through a special rehabilitation program. I'm just kidding, she just uses this as a cover so she can use hypnosis on the recovering criminals to trick them into revealing the location of their treasure hoards. Number 53. Jean Basson was a prospector who was hit by an avalanche and frozen in ice for 100 years. After thawing out, he decided to push back the wilderness and tame the West. And here we thought the newer generations had no regard for nature. Number 54. Arpeggio is obsessed with the flying machines of Da Vinci because he himself is a bird incapable of flight and is desperately searching for a way to overcome his inability. Number 55. For Sly 2, Sucker Punch was kind enough to cater to the few people that own the PlayStation 2's USB microphone. Talking into it during gameplay will allow the player to distract their foes, or, you know, blow Sly's cover, depending on when you make noise. Be sure not to play with a cold, though, because yes, sneezing can actually attract unwanted attention. Number 56. In the museum that Sly infiltrates during the tutorial of Sly 2, you will find the portraits on the wall may look familiar. Some of them depict bosses Sly fought in the original game, while other portraits show early concept art of Sly himself. Number 57. Sly 2 originally included a mission in Monaco which would have had Bentley hijack a yacht. He would have driven it into the docks and used it to ram into the casino, but it was cut from the game due to constraints with both scheduling and the game's overall size. Number 58. During the game's last cutscene, a pink record can be seen next to Carmelita's chair when she and Sly are discussing music. The record seems to read, Neil Diamond Live, and could be a subtle joke referring to Neil Diamond's song, Carmelita's Eyes. Number 59. Jojo the Raccoon steals the show in Sly 2 with a cameo appearance in the episode A Tangled Web. At the end of the crypt, if you use the binoculum while standing atop a pillar, you will see Sly's spiritual forefather floating above the coffin, which is a pretty grim implication. Number 60. Sucker Punch pays respect to their original protagonist, Rocket, from Rocket Robot on Wheels in A Tangled Web as well. A tombstone in the graveyard reads, Rest in Peace Rocket, a moment of silence for the beloved 64-bit hero. Number 61. Sly 2 was generally better received upon its release than its predecessor and is considered by fans and critics alike to be the best entry in the whole series. GameSpy placed Sly 2 at number 23 on their 25 best PlayStation 2 games of all time. Number 62. A secret demo for Sly 2 is hidden within Insomniac's Ratchet & Clank Up Your Arsenal. Just hold down R1, R2, L1, and L2 at the title screen. Not only does this demo inform Ratchet fans of Sly's greatness, but completing it will grant the player a cheat for Up Your Arsenal 
arsenal that replaces Ratchet's wrench with a double-bladed laser sword. Eat your heart out, Darth Maul. Number 63. Sly 3 had the shortest production cycle of any game Sucker Punch has ever made, finishing development in less than 12 months. The game was released only a year after Sly 2. Number 64. In Sly 3, one can find a poster in the level Bloodbath Bay that reads Dev and Karen Wedding, August 05. This is a reference to the real-life wedding of Sucker Punch co-workers turned lovers Dev Madan and Karen Yamajawa, which occurred during the game's production. Number 65. For the original release of Sly 3, Sucker Punch added a 3D feature to the game that could be toggled on and off with one pair of 3D glasses included in every box. Number 66. During the scene in Sly 3 where Ayers Rock is introduced, Murray says he has received training from the Guru. One of the pictures that accompanies this line is of the Guru latching onto Murray's back. It's identical to an iconic shot in The Empire Strikes Back in which Yoda is on Luke's back. Number 67. In the credits of Sly 3, it is said that the Guru took on a rock star and his friends as students, which brought a lot of unwanted media attention. This is a reference to the Beatles, who were very much into the teachings of Indian meditation guru Maharashi Mahesh Yogi. Number 68. In Sly 3's credits, Terry Rose, who voiced the Guru, is incorrectly credited as voicing the Shaman. Number 69. During some point in 2005, Vigil Games, the guys behind the Darksiders games, were interested in creating a Sly Cooper game for Sony's PlayStation Portable. However, the studio ditched the project before a proper pitch was completed and only ever had some concept art created. Not much is known about Sly's cancelled PSP debut, but the concept art appears to suggest that it would have taken place throughout different eras of time via time travel, a concept that would be later explored in Sly Cooper Thieves in Time. Number 70. After six years of being absent from the gaming scene, Sly made his triumphant return to gaming. Not in Sly 4, but in Sony's questionable answer to expendable Wii titles, PlayStation Move Heroes, where he appeared alongside Ratchet, Clank, Jack, and Daxter. You know, because they're heroes. And they move. Number 71. Sly appears as a fighter in Sony's jab at Super Smash Bros. PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, in which he can claim vengeance on Sucker Punch's new poster child, Cole McGrath from Infamous. He even got a slick new redesign to commemorate the occasion. Number 72. Appropriately enough, Sly Cooper's rival character in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale is Nathan Drake, another legendary PlayStation thief. Number 73. PlayStation All-Stars sticks with the concept that Sly can't swim, and instead has him rowing atop a TNT barrel in water stages. Number 74. Sly is the only character in PlayStation All-Stars who cannot block attacks. Holding the block button will instead make Sly turn invisible until the player is either attacked or releases the button. Number 75. In 2010, Sony remastered and re-released the Sly Cooper trilogy in HD for the Sony PlayStation 3 as the Sly Collection. In 2014, the games were ported again, this time for release on the PlayStation Vita portable system, meaning you could take every Sly game with you wherever you went. Number 76. If you complete all three Sly games in the Sly Collection for PS3, you will unlock a teaser trailer for Sly Cooper Thieves in Time. While it may not be much of a reward now, it must have been one heck of a surprise for gamers back in 2011. Number 77. Sly 3 was not originally released in Japan. Sly's Eastern fans had to wait one year after the game's initial release to get their hands on the game as part of the Sly Collection on the PlayStation 3. Number 78. The boss fight with Ms. Ruby in the original game is rhythm-based and in sync with the soundtrack that plays during the battle. Those who have played this boss fight in the HD remaster on PlayStation 3 may have had a bit more trouble with the fight as the developers remixed the song but didn't update the rhythm mechanic to match it, making for a much more irritating encounter. Number 79. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time is the first game in the series to not be developed by Sucker Punch Productions. It was instead helmed by Senzaru Games, the developer behind such titles as Secret Agent Clank and Sonic Boom Fire and Ice. Before Thieves in Time, Senzaru was tasked with remastering the first three games for the PlayStation 3 with the Sly Collection. Number 80. During the development of Thieves in Time, Senzaru Games held two contests that allowed fans to design treasures that would appear in the final game for Sly to steal and take back to his hideout. There was one contest for the US and one for Europe. Some of the winning designs include Ms. Puffin's Cookie Jar and the bottle of bright cane polish. Number 81. The animated cinematics for Thieves in Time were created by Ghostbot, the animators behind the popular web series Happy Tree Friends Kapow. Number 82. Quite a few of the trophy names in Thieves in Time are references to other games. Navigate Like Drake is a reference to PlayStation's other famous thief, Nathan Drake from the Uncharted series, while the Ancient Warfare 3 trophy is a play on Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Number 83. Not only was Thieves in Time a cross-platform 
cross-platform title between the PlayStation 3 and PS Vita, the two systems could also be used simultaneously to enhance the game's overall experience. While one plays the PS3 version, they can also use the PS Vita to scan for treasure. How very Nintendo of them. Number 84. During the prologue of Thieves in Time, Bentley is seen in the sewers, which prompts him to say, The last time I was in these sewers, I was just a teenager. If you didn't get it already, this is a reference to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Number 85. In Episode 3 of Thieves in Time, in a cave on the most northern part of the map, the player can find a cave painting of the Sanzaru logo on the wall. Number 86. You can actually see Clockwork quite a few times throughout the different eras of Thieves in Time, just watching Sly from a distance. This is actually a very fitting easter egg when you take into account that Clockwork was once an immortal with a grudge against Sly's bloodline. Number 87. In Thieves in Time, one can see that Bentley has a vandalized picture of his ex-girlfriend Penelope on the dashboard of his Binocucon. Not only has he shown his bitterness by very maturely drawing devil horns on her head, but he's also drawn a plus and minus sign over each eye, which resembles the eyes of the monkey head that serves as the logo for Senzaru games. Number 88. During Thieves in Time's prologue, when the gang jumps back in time, their license plate remains behind, spinning on the ground. This is identical to a scene in Back to the Future when the DeLorean time machine travels into the past, leaving behind its spinning, out-of-time license plate. Number 89. Collecting 15 Sly Masks in Thieves in Time will grant the player the ultimate Sly costume, which closely resembles Batman's Batsuit. The most distinguishable similarities are the chest emblem, cowl, and the utility belt. Jury's out on whether it comes outfitted with shark repellent, though. Number 90. During Thieves in Time, Sly can trade in his cane for the weapons of other PlayStation heroes. Collecting 50 masks will grant Sly access to Ratchet's wrench from Ratchet and Clank, while collecting 60 masks will allow Sly to nab Cole's amp from Infamous 2. Number 91. Thieves in Time contains a treasure called the Dragon Claw, the description for which claims that it once belonged to a giant owl. If you have any doubt about whether it belongs to Clockwork, look beneath the treasure to find an inscription that reads, Clockwork was here. Number 92. During the briefings that occur before the final job of every chapter of Thieves in Time, you can see a bit of binary code scrolling across the screen. If you manage to decode it, you'll spell out E-N-T-L, a portion of the name Bentley. Number 93. In the Thieves in Time mission where Sly breaks Ryochi Cooper free, take a look at the map and zoom all the way out. You'll see that the shape of the level is actually a reversed version of Sly's cane. Number 94. Sly's father, Connor Cooper, became a thieving legend after he succeeded in stealing the world's biggest diamond. Number 95. According to lead designer Matt Kramer, Thieves in Time was going to have an unlockable game mode called Horseshoe Mode. In this challenge mode, the player would replay the story with the thief meter disabled and the player would be able to be killed in one hit unless they picked up a lucky charm or horseshoe to give them an extra hit. This challenge from hell was cut due to time constraints, and completionists everywhere rejoiced. Number 96. The medieval metal man treasure found in Thieves in Time bears a striking resemblance to Clank from Insomniac's Ratchet and Clank series. Number 97. If the Lutrella Nividensis treasure found in Thieves in Time looks familiar to some of you PlayStation fans out there, you're probably familiar with Naughty Dog's Jack and Daxter franchise, as the creature looks identical to our favorite Otzel, Daxter. And much like Daxter, this creature is also known for its loud mouth. Number 98. Thieves in Time was never released in Japan, making it exclusive to the Western world. Maybe they'll get it in a re-remaster collection of the series for the PS4. Number 99. In November of 2014, Senzaru announced that they had no plans to develop any further Sly Cooper titles, instead refocusing all of their efforts on creating games for the much-beloved Sonic Boom franchise. Great trade, guys. Round of applause, everybody. Number 100. Sly makes a cameo appearance in the Ratchet and Clank movie. When Clank is scanning Ratchet to find out his species, Sly is one of the subjects used as a cross-reference. Number 101. In January of 2014, Sony announced that Sly Cooper would also be coming to the big screen. The film will be written and directed by Kevin Monroe, known for his work on the 2007 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film. Much like the Ratchet and Clank film, it will be 3D animated, and hopefully, that is where the similarities end. Number 102. While some of the actors in the games will reprise their roles for the movies, Kevin Miller will not be returning to the role of Sly, which was a creative choice made by the studio. Actor Ian James James Corlett will instead don the mask of the thieving protagonist. Corlett previously served as the original English voice of Goku, Mega Man from the 90s cartoon of the same name, and Coconuts from the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. You know, the friggin' insane one. Number 103. While Kevin Miller felt disappointed at first to not play the film role of Sly, he is excited to experience Sly Cooper from the fan perspective and understands that the movie may require an actor bigger than himself to portray Sly in order to better promote the movie. And that, my friend, is a team player. Number 104. The 
the plot of the movie will be something of a retelling of the events from the first game, with Sly and his friends setting out on a global adventure to retrieve the Thievius Raccoonus from Clockwork. Number 105. While the film won't serve as an origin story, and Sly and his friends will have already formed the famous trio we all know and love, they won't have quite peaked yet and will have a long way to go before mastering their abilities. Number 106. When the teaser trailer for the film was released, many Sly fans were critical of Murray's redesign. The official Twitter for the film responded to the calm, constructive criticism that the fans had to offer and promised that his design would be tweaked. And number 107, Games Radar honored Sly in 2013 by naming him the 74th greatest video game hero on their list of the top 100 video game heroes of all time. They referred to him as the Danny Ocean of gaming. Once again, I'm Jacob, and thanks for watching 107 Facts about Sly Cooper. Which game in the series is your favorite? Do you know of any other Easter eggs? Comment below and let us know. We have new videos videos dropping every week, so let us know what game you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your games, subscribe to the Leaderboard, where we help you game smarter.